Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Whether you're part of the White Oak Collaborative, an ally and friend of our military and veteran connected community, or working tirelessly for our Afghan refugees, or interested in doing so, thank you for everything you're doing. I want to thank you. I want to welcome you and thank the White Oak Steering Committee for their leadership and quick pivot to address the situation in Afghanistan. Um, if I could share the um, White Oak Steering Committee slide, please. These are the members of our steering committee um, came together very quickly. And these are the folks we have to thank for being with us here today. For those of you unfamiliar with the White Oak Collaborative, let me share a bit about who we are and what we do. The White Oak Collaborative is a cross-sector co coalition of organizations committed to supporting service members, veterans, wounded warriors, caregivers, survivors, and their families. We have over 250 members representing military and veteran support organizations as well as our cross-sector partners in the nonprofit, private, philanthropic, government, and community sectors. It's been fantastic to see Americans come together to support the Afghan resettlement efforts during this really difficult time for all of us. The purpose of this webinar is to see what we can do to help each other through collaboration. All of us have interest in doing something to help address the crisis in Afghanistan and refugees, and we all have some, some different kinds of expertise that we can bring to bear. Here's why Blue Star Families is involved in this. First of all, we, are, uh, we care about our community and our community cares about this issue. Uh, those who have served in the military and are currently serving feel very close to the issues in Afghanistan. It affects our mental health and it motivates us to want to get involved. So it's appropriate for us to be here. We are people who care about national security. We wouldn't serve, our families wouldn't serve if we didn't. Just as we know we have to take care of our veterans if we hope to have new recruits, we believe we have to take care of our allies if we hope to have new allies in the future. So this effort supports our national security. And finally, we know that we need to work together in a field. Blue Star Families believes in collaborative action and by fostering uh, the, the collaborative as a whole by fostering this uh, forum is allowing us all to do our work better. For us personally at Blue Star Families, we're experts in welcoming and creating a sense of community for people, a sense of belonging in the communities where they live. And so that's something we personally hope to bring to this fight. We know each of you on this call have something that they can bring as well. There's much to cover in this next hour and a half. Please engage in the chat to share your resources. Tell us what's working, what you want to know, um, how we can help or how you hope to help. To start off this next period, I am joined by a friend and leader who is always ready to respond in a crisis, Art Dela Cruz. Art is the CEO of Team Rubicon. Art, thanks for joining us today, and I hope that you can give us an update in the considerable work that Team Rubicon is doing and giving us some advice about how we can help. Yeah, thank you, Kathy, and thanks to everyone uh, who is here today for obviously stepping forward and trying to ensure that we as Kathy articulately said, you know, welcome our allies um, to our communities. Um, Team Rubicon is a national disaster response organization, which is how we got into Afghan resettlement. Um, as the Afghans and the Af families in the evacuation were resettling at the military bases, we made connections via the National Volunteer Organization Active in Disasters, NVOAD, of which we are a member. And we identified that we could potentially have um, impact at the bases um, that they were planning to do the resettlement in. And it started initially with um, us becoming involved and it went through the uh, DepSec Desk Office. Uh, we ended up on the bases speaking to the DCOs or the coordinating officers essentially who were signed um, out of Fifth Army. Uh, we worked through NORTHCOM, which was our connection into DOD. And recently, a lot of the veteran organizations have connected with DHS, who has recently um, taken over the lead. And I think it's important to start first by saying uh, there's an incredible coalition of people, many of you already on this call, um, active in this. Um, but I think to Kathy's call to action here, the way we have seen it over the course of the past week that we've been involved is there's really three things you need to think about. The first is what can you do? Uh, every organization has very specific capabilities. I was on a wonderful call with 
Ryan Mannion from the Travis Mannion Foundation. They had some incredible skills in being able to link their veterans up with um, children, you know, in these, these, these Afghan families as they resettled. Uh, so they're applying their specialty. For us, after the pandemic, we'd begun to understand that logistics and being able to sort uh, and, and meet needs was going to be one of our strengths. And we have volunteered to help with um, distribution and management of donated goods. Um, so that what can we do is going to be really, really important as we move forward as, again, a collaborative um, coalition. The other thing I think we need to understand is when we do it. Um, it is not, uh, you know, some of the discussions that we've had, particularly on the basis where it's primar primarily um, humanitarian parolees on the basis, you know, it will be months and months until the resettlement process is complete for them. So being able to understand when you can um, deliver the services that your organization can uniquely deliver will be also very important to take into consideration. I think everyone you know, is running uh, into the fight uh, today, but understand that this will be an enduring um, marathon of meeting critical needs and services um, to these Afghan families who deserve it so much. And I think the third question, you know, as we continue to speak today is where can we do it? You know, we are presently at, uh, in Texas and New Mexico at Fort Bliss, Fort McCoy uh, in Volk out of Wisconsin, McGuire in New Jersey, and now up to three different locations in Virginia. Um, so at these locations, these are the staging areas where most of the processing is happening, but the number of communities that have raised their hands to resettle, again, the Afghan families, numbers uh, north of 140. Um, so that's where that third question of, of where can we do it uh, will become really important. Um, the other thing we've realized is this is an incredible coalition. Um, I'm actually in Chicago. I'm traveling to Fort McCoy tomorrow, but I know that uh, American Red Cross is handling, you know, the, the housing situation there. Catholic Charities uh, is, ha is taking care of uh, the morale and welfare functions and IRC is doing the in-processing. So uh, it, it's again a, a great example of, you know, do what you do best and partner for the rest um, because there is a lot of work um, going on. I would, you know, finish by saying certainly uh, open to uh, any questions, you know, feel free to contact me by email, but uh, hopefully Kathy that uh, gets us started out in the, the right direction here. Perfect. Art, And thank you so much. I, I don't, I don't need to remind people that with the earthquake in Haiti and the response to Hurricane Ida, uh, along with the situation in Afghanistan, Timur Bakan is very busy and we really appreciate you making time for us and we'll keep you involved in these efforts if we may. Of course, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Now I'm really pleased to welcome a true and long uh, standing civic leader, John Bridgeland, CEO of Civic to join us today. John is st st Bridge is st standing up a new initiative focusing on our Afghan allies that we as a community have an opportunity to join. It's called Welcome US. Bridge, thanks for taking time to join us today. Um, can you start off with just explaining to us what is Welcome US? Sure, so thanks Kathy and, and our friends at Blue Star Families and White Oak and uh, so many of you for our strong partnership uh, in COVID response to our COVID collaborative. And, and I want to thank everyone uh, for all you've done for our country over so many years, including Art. I saw Team Rubicon featured on CNN this week, the extraordinary work you're doing in response to Hurricane Ida. So just congratulations. You know, I know uh, many of you are working, you know, deeply with your own communities and reaffirming the value of their service. An effort that can unite us as a country even in this difficult time with so many challenges is to help our Afghan allies who helped keep us safe for two decades after 9-11. Uh, I served in the White House before and after 9-11 and remember so clearly how we expected repeated waves of attacks and how service members stepped up and, and saw firsthand the critical work uh, with our allies in Afghanistan. Now these allies are coming here to our shores. And so next week we're launching uh, welcome.us. It's an initiative to inspire, educate, and engage uh, Americans and her institutions in helping Afghans resettle in what we expect to be from our friends of the State Department, about 20 communities around the United States. We have a formal uh, MOU with the US Department of State 
a really strong partnership with the extraordinary resettlement agencies. And I see the extraordinary Krish uh, from LIRS, who's actually going to be one of our leading spokespeople, uh, leaders in the business, faith-based and NGO communities, uh, more than 27 governors who uh, are want to be welcome states across political divides, which is so encouraging, and Afghan leaders and organizations in the country all working together to do three concrete things. First, we'll provide a clearinghouse of opportunities for Americans and institutions uh, that can help with housing, food, uh, health and medical, transportation, legal aid, and more. We're also working to generate commitments, substantial commitments from the private sector, following the extraordinary commitment that our partner Airbnb made, uh, offering 20,000 Afghan refugees housing. And we're creating a significant welcome fund with philanthropy that will support uh, resettlement efforts. Second, storytelling and, and the media are so important to lift up the power of uh, helping uh, those who have helped us. And so we we will be featuring real stories from American communities of how they're welcoming and supporting refugees, including the extraordinary work uh, of veterans serving organizations. And finally, um, we're building a national coalition with leaders that transcend politics and sectors. We're thrilled to have General Stan McChrystal yet again. He's been a leader on our COVID collaborative. We work with Kathy and the team with the extraordinary team at the Department of Defense to boost vaccine uptake with really good results and, and having people like Stan and others by our side and, and military leaders like Michael Breen, who uh, leads Human Rights First and will be providing legal aid as these parolees hopefully become asylees and get integrated into our community. So the idea is to have a whole country response like we, we've had with our COVID collaborative governors, mayors, business, private sector, faith leaders, and a very strong partnership with the White House and the State Department. So we invite you to make common cause with us in a few ways, and I, I will bring this to, to a close. Join our coalition for welcome.us uh, to list your logo, publicize that you're part of it, and then we in turn will amplify and publicize uh, the extraordinary work you're doing. As we learn more specific details, as Art was alluding to, about the 20 or so communities where Afghans will be resettled, We'd like to partner with you very concretely in those cities and communities uh, to mobilize on the ground, additional on the ground capacity to support the resettlement agencies and their affiliates um, uh, so that these Afghan uh, allies have all the support they, they need and deserve. And finally, to share videos and inspiring stories with us about how VSOs and veterans are working to help Afghans integrate into American communities and become productive citizens in the United States. My dear friend and ally, Alan Casey, who co-founded City Year and worked with many of you over many years, is on our team. And Kathy and her team will provide uh, the network Alan's email address to follow up. We really hope you join the coalition, get involved in this effort, and uh, um, really make this an all-country response at a moment of national crisis. So thank you so much for inviting me. Back to you, Kathy. Thank you, Bridge. And I just we're so glad to be partnered with you on this largely as a sector. I know you made a comment to me that there's a particular um, value that you feel to bring the military and veteran serving organizations into the coalition. I wonder if you just wanted to make one more um, comment about that before we let you go. Yeah, I just, you know, service is, yes, thank you. Service is, you know, so much in your DNA. The mission does, the mission does continue. And just seeing, having worked uh, over the years on efforts where veteran serving organizations have been fundamental to effective organization coordinate, coordination, the biggest challenge I think will actually be harnessing all this capacity from the country and interest in wanting to provide support to Afghan refugees and then connecting those up with the specific concrete needs that the resettlement agencies and others are, are working to meet and having the veteran serving organizations working side by side in local communities where it's really going to matter. And Art really inspired me the other day when he started talking about this idea. Uh, that to me is, a, is an extraordinary uh, additional contribution to what you're already doing on so many issues. So yes, thank you. Wonderful, thank you. We'll be sending out more information in the after action to all of our participants today to see more about Welcome US and to see how each of us can get involved. Um, I am now uh, delighted to turn hosting duties over to my friend and partner collaborator, uh, collaborator uh, Kobe Langley, 
Kobe is Senior Vice President, International Services and Service of the Armed Forces at the American Red Cross. He's a member of the White Oak Collaborative Steering Committee and our Board of Overseers as well. Uh, he has been a partner, a friend for many years, honored to host with him today, Kobe. Oh, and but before I ask you to, uh, to, to move on with the speakers, I, I, I want to ask you to spend a little bit of time talking about what Red Cross is doing with Afga Afghan ally resettlement. So what's your latest update and how can those of us on this call help? Thanks, Kathy. Um, so the American Red Cross uh, was engaged um, uh, almost uh, now two weeks ago with uh, the Department of Defense and the State Department in providing um, key logistics as well as morale welfare, morale welfare and uh, in key items, uh, durable goods and non-durable goods supplies to the uh, Afghan refugees, principally those that were supporting um, and or uh, continue to support uh, the State Department uh, and, uh, and the Department of Defense. Importantly, um, this response effort is, uh, is pretty significant. Um, so we're engaged in uh, no less than 20 different locations um, overseas as well as here domestically. Uh, there was, of course, an announcement that was made a couple days ago that, that, uh, that talked with a little bit more specifics about the, the different locations. So none of this information hasn't been publicly shared by the Department of Defense. And so I'll just make sure that uh, you know, I mentioned that, um, but as you can imagine, uh, you know, we're a mass care support operation, so we're uh, standing up uh, huge uh, shelters and support locations around the United States and are uh, also providing durable goods and non-durable goods uh, overseas. So um, it's an important operation. I think, uh, you know, the NTU visa holders in particular are individuals that um, are at great risk of uh, physical harm to themselves and to their family members if they didn't make it out of the country. Uh, you know, I, I myself um, uh, helped to facilitate the return of uh, my interpreter uh, from Iraq uh, many, many years ago. And uh, of course, um, many people on this call know and understand the threats that uh, those individuals face uh, to include, you know, harm, physical harm to uh, their loved ones and, and kidnapping and, and even death sometimes. So uh, it's very important that we try to provide as much support as we can. So America Red Cross has been doing that for about part of two weeks now. Um, so just a couple different locations, uh, you know, uh, Ramstein is, of course, the big, big location where we're providing a, sh a shelter support, hygiene items, blankets, baby supplies. A lot of these individuals are, are leaving uh, country and theater with literally nothing, um, you know, uh, no, no shoes on their feet, literally. Uh, that's not an exaggeration. Um, and we're also looking at different locations to provide support for unaccompanied minors, which, which are there are also a handful of those as well. Um, partner coordination is extremely important. Uh, we'll be looking to onboard different nonprofit organizations to support these operations, both domestically uh, and internationally, but principally domestically um, with the Department of State and uh, the Department of Homeland Security, who's now the executive agent for these operations. Um, so I did want to give a little bit more detail about where folks can uh, look to provide uh, outreach and support. So next slide, please. Um, so uh, over, overseas, um, what we're currently providing are um, mass care experts, uh, dormitory management. So these are uh, individuals that are experts in, in how to manage uh, the living quarters for people that are providing support. Partner coordination is an extremely important uh, tool uh, and, and task that we need to accomplish pretty much everywhere uh, we, we're currently located. Uh, we're obviously um, not particularly looking for support in restoring family link service. This is an opportunity for uh, Afghanistan evacuees who in their haste have not been able to maintain contact with their loved ones. So the American Red Cross does maintain a safe and well website that allows people to get reconnected. Uh, and that's a global network, which includes connections and locations uh, outside of Afghanistan. So we may also have uh, refugees that are trying to reach family members outside of Afghanistan. We can help facilitate that support. Volunteers are supporting operation. It's really important. Uh, we are 90% um, volunteer run organization, which is uh, why, you know, nonprofit partners and organizations that can assist and facilitate us to include uh, even some of our federal partners that are, are now working to volunteer with this, like the Department of Veterans Affairs and, and other folks as well. Um, you know, currently what it looks like is, uh, you know, we're looking for uh, two week assignments for about up to six weeks and in some locations, uh, they, they can be a little bit longer. Um, uh, not looking to push a ton of people overseas, but uh, we, we may need some support overseas. Uh, in general, we expect this operation to run through December, uh, through the end of this, uh, this calendar year. Next slide. Um, and uh, what, we're, what, we're, what, we're, what are we providing? So a lot of questions about what's needed. Uh, and, and I will say, uh, you know, right now that um, because our logistics supply chain is, is, is well, well tuned, it's a machine, uh, we, we have uh, vendors in place and, uh, and are well equipped to purchase goods in, the, in those locations. In-kind donations are important. 
um, but they are they are sometimes very challenging to accept in response operations like this. That's why uh, getting organizations like Team Rubicon and other new, uh, and, and other uh, partners uh, to help assist in that is extremely important. Um, you know, people do like to give a lot of goods, and and that's important. Uh, the American Red Cross is principally focused on providing relief uh, supplies and services. So cover kits, personal protective equipment, uh, clothing and shoes, snacks, drinks, formula. There's there's quite a, a huge need to help support uh, infants and toddlers. Uh, crib sheets, wipes, detergent, wristbands, blankets, and towels. Uh, so, so far, just uh, overseas, we've provided over 42,000 comfort kits to the uh, evacuees. Um, we've provided over 65,000 emergency supplies and over 65,000 snacks. And so, on average, you know, we're, we're turning in, anywhere between six to 7,000 uh, supplies and items every single day. And uh, we don't see that slowing down anytime now uh, into the foreseeable future as they determine where these Afghan refugees are into uh, visa holders who have been supporting US Armed Forces and State Department, where they're ultimately gonna land. That's, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be there for wherever DOD, state or DHS wants us to be. Um, we're uh, currently located over 32 locations overseas. So we'll be uh, well prepared to support that operation. Next slide. Um, so uh, so I, I point everybody to uh, the public open source information uh, that was provided by uh, General uh, Van Herrick. Um, as uh, most of you guys, uh, most folks in this call know, uh, US NORTHCOM is, was the operational lead uh, up until a couple of days ago when that, that went to Department of Homeland Security. Um, so the key locations, uh, as were mentioned earlier, Fort Bliss, Fort McCoy, Fort Dix, New Jersey, Fort Pickett. Um, and there are a couple of other locations that were also announced on that press, um, on that presser and the American Red Cross is supporting most, if not all those locations. There's some uh, very large locations like uh, Dulles and Dulles Airport and of course, Philadelphia that we're also supporting. Uh, and I already mentioned the Okona sites in, in Europe. Uh, no, no sites in Asia just yet, but we're, we're certainly standing by if, if, in case that's, uh, that the, those support requests come in. Next slide. Uh, so again, uh, public source, August 27th, uh, you can see locations here, Fort Bliss, Fort McCoy, uh, Laker Sticks, um, uh, Holloman, uh, Fort Lee, uh, Quantico, Fort Pickett, uh, a few other ones since then. Um, and then you see the numbers uh, that were also announced by DOD. Um, we have about 21,000. That's a little bit more than that now, but 21,000 is publicly announced. And we also expect uh, we also expect that uh, we'll see that number uh, reach 50,000 in those locations. Uh, and that's what uh, General Van Hurt announced uh, on the 27th. And I, I think that's probably accurate from based upon what we're seeing. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Um, next. So uh, also importantly, uh, because the American Red Cross is a part of a global Red Cross Red Crescent network, um, I do I do want to acknowledge the special support that we do receive globally because we are in a unique position along with uh, organizations like um, Blue Star Families and like BFW and like the USO, uh, there are a ton of nonprofit organizations that are working internationally that are on military locations. Um, and, and so we do have a, a, small, a smaller amount of support networks there. And so we do reach out occasionally to other Red Cross national societies to help provide support. And in this case, uh, they answered that call. I was on the call with the secretary generals and presidents of each one of these Red Crosses. Uh, over a week ago, and they were able to help provide uh, emergency surge support for supplies, uh, Spanish Red Cross, German Red Cross, Italian Red Cross, just to name a, a couple, uh, jumped in immediately to help provide support. And as you can imagine, particularly in Germany, uh, dealing with their own response efforts around the floods, uh, there were uh, it was quite generous support that they provided to us as well. So these covers uh, this covers um, you know the the Red Cross update in terms of what we're providing and where we're providing it. The question that we receive quite frequently from uh, many individuals, there are three. One, uh, can you assist us in getting individuals out of the country as a part of the Red Cross Red Crescent Network? Yes, we're in contact with the Afghanistan Red Crescent. No, uh, the American Red Cross can't assist in facilitating um, the expedited uh, uh, evacuation of, of any individual in, inside of uh, Afghanistan. Um, that's, uh, that, that's quite difficult for us to do. The second question we received, the second question we received a lot of information is how can we support your efforts um, and, and you know we we are uh, accepting donations for the operation, so of course we can uh, would be more than willing to accept uh, donations for the operation. It is uh, it is quite an expensive venture. And the last question is is how can we help uh, if if we uh, if we can't donate funds? And I would say we are recruiting volunteers. The current operation has approximately 600 staff and volunteer excuse me 200 staff and volunteers that are operational uh, in uh, over 20 different locations globally. So. We do run on volunteers and we'll be recruiting additional volunteers and partner organizations uh, that are providing support and will continue to provide support like Team Rubicon 
Blue Star families, uh, TAPS, and many, many others that are on this call. Um, so uh, with that, uh, what I'd like to do is I, I would very much like to uh, introduce um, a wonderful a partner and and uh, an ally uh, in our uh, our fight to support uh, the uh, um, Afghan resettlement. Um, uh, Krish uh, is an amazing leader, uh, and she works as the CEO of Lutheran Immigration Refugee Ser uh, Services. And so I wanted to uh, uh, to uh, thank um, uh, Krish for her participation today in this forum, and specifically uh, for her leadership for over 80 years in Lutheran Immigration Immigration and Refugee Services. She's been a champion for refugees and migrants from around the globe for many, many years, and uh, her organization has welcomed over 500,000 refugees and migrants. Um, so, Krish, if you wouldn't mind, just uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Afghan, uh, the Afghan ally resettlement locations um, and about your organization. That would be fantastic. Great. Uh, thank you, Kobe. Really appreciate the opportunity. Um, so, as Kobe said, my name is Krish Omer Vignaja, and I'm the president and CEO of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, or LIRS. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, um, LIRS is the largest faith-based national nonprofit dedicated exclusively to immigrants and refugees. Um, we have been doing this work for 80 years. I'm told that I hide our age well. Um, in terms of Afghan allies, we've resettled nearly 10,000 Afghan allies since the program began in 2009. Uh, so LRS and our partners um, are currently preparing for the arrival of tens of thousands of Afghan nationals. Already we've seen a massive uptick in walk-ins um, at our offices really across the country. Um, in particular, uh, we have historically seen and expect um, there to be significant um, upticks in Texas, California, Virginia, uh, Maryland, and DC. Um, Pennsylvania will also you know, uh, house a number of these families. And we expect thousands more to come in the coming days. Um, it is daunting in some ways, uh, but honestly, I have no doubt in our ability to serve and welcome all of these Afghan neighbors um, because we, along with our fellow resettlement agencies have uh, done this work before and we are lucky to have so much community support. So just to give you a little bit of context for kind of what we are expecting. So Afghans will come to the United States uh, through a few different categories. Um, so one is the special immigrant visas. You've probably heard a lot of bit about a lot of, of, of about these individuals, interpreters, drivers, engineers, et cetera. Then there's the traditional refugees. I know that someone in the chat had asked about uh, the P2 category. So these are people who are going to come in through the traditional refugee resettlement system. And then the third category is what we call the Afghan humanitarian parolees. This will encompass the largest group by far of what we expect in coming days. So basically due to the urgent evacuation of needing to get people out of Afghanistan as quickly as possible, the majority of our Afghan neighbors entered the US and will continue to enter the US uh, through the humanitarian parole system. So while the United States Refugee Admissions Program has had uh, you know, programs and systems in place for SIV recipients and priority applicants, the Afghan humanitarian parolee status has essentially been defined only in the past few weeks. So unfortunately, that means that many of our new Afghan neighbors will not have the same access to programs and services as SIV or refugee applicants, including you know, the five years of ongoing services that's typically funded by the Office of Refugee Resettlement, uh, plus any public benefits to cover you know, rent um, prior to employment, uh, Medicaid, food stamps. So LRS and our partners have had to work with the government to stand up a parallel support system for the Afghan humanitarian parolees. And so the result is this APS, this Emergency Case Management Program um, that we're working with the State Department um, to launch. Um, it will help these families, individuals for 90 days. Um, under APS, new arrivals will receive initial relocation support services, including housing, assistance with school enrollment, uh, food, um, as well as we'll be supplying them with work authorization um, and a couple more kind of tidbits here and there. It's an encouraging step, so want to really express our gratitude. Uh, but the reality is, is that it is simply not enough. Um, you know, I, I don't, I think, need to draw this out in, in too great detail, but just imagine that for a moment, right? After an extremely traumatic few days, few weeks, few months, um, you have left behind your entire uh, life. Um, you fled to a new country, in some cases, with just the clothes on your back. 
you're mourning for those you've lost, for the family that you had to leave behind. Uh, you know, just bear in mind, parents and spouses, for example, would not have been typically authorized to enter. So you're tra trying to navigate an unfamiliar land in an unfamiliar language. Do you think that you'd be fully integrated and set up for success um, just based on three months of support? Obviously, we don't think so. And that's why LRS is currently raising private funds to ensure at least an additional three months of services and support, meaning that we can help these families for a total of six months. Um, obviously, our hope is to uh, expand that to a year or two or beyond. Um, we have secured some corporate and foundational partners who are offering financial and in-kind donations, such as Airbnb, Walmart, Deloitte, um, Bank of America, uh, but the need is still great. So that is why we are looking to the great leadership of Bridge and other groups and are so grateful for this opportunity to speak to you all today. At LRS, we believe in what we call the long welcome. And so that means that our Afghan neighbors will need uh, you know, support far beyond these first three months or these first six months or even that first year. So that is where we believe that there's a need to have a community of welcome committed to um, you know, welcoming these individuals uh, so that they become our neighbors, our friends, and ultimately our family. So over the past several weeks, we've received more than 42,000 volunteer applications. If that doesn't show you the compassion and empathy of the American people, I don't know what does. Um, but that's honestly two thirds of, of, of how far we need to go. So we still have a ways. Our team is hard at work in terms of connecting folks with opportunities, but these are the things where we could use your support. So airport pickup, apartment setup, um, tutors who can serve as, uh, you know, um, assist with English language classes. Um, you know, being able to provide pro, pro bono legal, legal services. Um, this is very time intensive work. Like what Kobe was describing, what we are gonna need to undertake here uh, in the US, in the final destinations of these individuals is gonna be critically dependent on how much the community support we can get. We expect that volunteer opportunities and needs will continue for months. And that is where we hope um, that uh, you know, this would be an opportunity to collaborate because we know that this is not a short-term plan. The success of the resettlement effort is a humanitarian, economic, and national security imperative. And that's why we look forward to working with all of you to ensure our Afghan neighbors get the heroes welcome they deserve. Thanks for having me. Kirsch, thanks so much for, um, for those really inspiring words, uh, organization that does this uh, for a living day in and day out. Um, you mentioned quite a few uh, things that are, are needed and will be needed for uh, the long reintegration and a commitment of three months is truly spectacular for LRS, uh, LIRS. And I'm really interested in what are some of the things um, that you don't need? And is there a coordination point for other military service organizations or veteran service organizations who may want to help support that work uh, because of this uh, unique obligation and dedication that we feel uh, to Afghan refugees? Yeah, I really appreciate that uh, question in terms of what we, we don't want. Honestly, at this point, we're taking really everything. I mean, you know, bear in mind, right? We're essentially trying to create new lives for these people. And so, you know, if you have an old bed, we could use that to furnish one of the apartments. The affordable housing crisis is obviously something that we as Americans have experienced. Just imagine if you don't have that nest egg, you don't have references of landlords previously. So honestly, the financial cast contributions are gonna be helpful because we're talking to landlords who are saying, yes, we will take one of these families, but we need six months of upfront costs. Um, so, you know, halal meats are something that we're trying to figure out. If there's Afghan restaurants that you know of and you might be able to connect us with, that would be great. A grocery store gift card. Um, as we're trying to plug these individuals into community-based resources, we know that in those first few weeks, even kind of petty cash is going to be hugely helpful. Um, so that's why we had launched a Neighbors in Need uh, Afghan Ally Fund. That is where you know that funding will will go. Um, we are starting to get a lot of clothes, uh, which is great. But um, you know, I think we're going to be uh, okay on that front. Um, what will, we don't need it right now because we're still trying to get a handle on how many kids will be coming as unaccompanied minors. But I did just want to flag this because obviously so many of us were moved when we saw, you know, soldiers cradling, uh, you know, babies and toddlers. Yeah, amazing, right? And so LIRS is one of the two agencies uh, across the country that works with unaccompanied refugee minors. So these children, they will come into the system as unaccompanied minors 
And then our plan is that they will be able to change their status into unaccompanied refugee minors. So I just wanted to know that, um, you know, we, we are always expanding our foster care network because we don't want these kids to be stuck in warehouses. You know, Fort Bliss is exactly where the families should go on a temporary basis. Just candidly, we don't believe that kids should be, you know, warehoused um, at military bases, that every child should get what we would want for our own children, which is a safe, small family-centric home. And that's what LRS tries to provide. And that's what we will do with these children. Thanks, Krish. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Every, every major military operation um, or, or iconic moment in uh, American history has a picture to tell a story. Um, I think our picture will be that Marine reaching across uh, the, um, uh, the wall there and grabbing that infant uh, to bring him, bring him or her to safety. And uh, you know, that, that is really what this is about. It's about doing what we need to do in the moment to take care uh, of these families that have given so much to the American military and to the American people. Chris, I can't thank you enough. It would be fantastic if you could drop uh, in the chat uh, the contact information for uh, any anybody that's looking to get in touch to help partner uh, with uh, LIRS. And thank you again for your leadership. Kathy, back to you. Thank you, Kobe, and thank you, Krish. Um, we're really looking forward to working together with you and we'll, we'll um, support any of our participants today in making sure we make those connections. To provide government updates, I'm joined now by John Broisley, the Chief Veterans Experience Officer at the Department of Veterans Affairs, who's really been doing fantastic work in keeping us all in the loop. John, I welcome you to share some updates you might have and any thoughts you might, any advice you might have for the organizations on this call. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Kathy. And it's great to see so many incredible partners on this call. Thank you all for everything that you that you all have been doing in the past few weeks and what you'll continue to do in the many months and years ahead. Uh, so in the last couple of weeks, um, and thanks to your support and your partnership um, for many of, uh, of these leaders on the call, we have been able to uh, collate a lot of the, not only VA resources, which includes a lot of our veteran crisis line or vet centers or veteran healthcare, veteran benefits resources available um, immediately following the fall of, of Kabul on that Monday, uh, sent out uh, messaging so that our veterans and their families knew that they weren't alone and that they could reach out to us, they could reach out to you all. And that, that campaign was incredibly successful. We sent it out to over 11 million customers. So veterans, families, caregivers, and survivors um, the, to be able to, to relay that to one another and, and, and really ensure that we um, share that information to our peers and to our, uh, to our buddies and, and, and fellow family members across the country. Uh, that was a, a fantastic response. We've also helped relay a lot of the State Department's information on how former commanders or former non-commissioned officers who have served uh, with uh, Afghan interpreters or other support personnel um, during uh, the last 20 years to uh, a really kind of a standard operating procedure on how they can um, support evidence that can help accelerate their case if they already have a case number as a special immigrant visa with the U.S. Department of State. And so when we relayed that to our VSO and MO, MSO and MOA partners with um, from VA, um, just wanted to say thank you all again for, for helping us get that messaging out. And we were able to connect dozens of, of individuals and their families with the with the hopefully the, the right process needed to to get out of the country in time. And then finally, uh, we you know we're, we've been coordinating, promoting a lot of the events that you've been sending us. So uh, our our big call to action uh, is to keep sending us the events and and the content that you all are providing. Uh, for not only uh, our veterans, their families, caregivers, and survivors, but also those special immigrant visas and their families um, that are coming over that we can help them resettle in many communities uh, throughout the country. Uh, so uh, if you've seen that, we just uh, put, put out an email yesterday, another email yesterday to about 1 million Afghanistan, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan era veterans and their families on specific events that are highlighting many of the partners that are on this call. And so uh, we're incredibly excited to um, share a lot of the, continue to share a lot of this information. You'll be receiving more, com more communication from us this week um, on family events that are specifically targeted for our families, caregivers, and survivors, and a blog, a corresponding blog that will detail a lot of the resources available. And we're also incredibly excited, uh, excited to be a big part of 
um, or a part of the interagency working group for the special immigrant visa resettlement that the Department of Homeland Security is, is uh, leading. And we'll, we'll continue to share more information on how to get involved in that. So uh, the, the last item that I wanted to mention is, uh, as, I, as, I, as I alluded to earlier, please continue to share all the great work that you're doing, um, specifically as it relates to special immigrant visa family resettlement uh, with our with our team. Uh, I think and Andy Martinez is on this call, so she can probably drop her email in the chat and I'll be happy to drop mine in the chat so that we can continue to amplify your efforts and make sure that we are here uh, as great partners of yours and continuing to support all of our veterans, their families, caregivers, survivors, and um, many of the, the organizations that are providing uh, the special immigrant visa resettlement. Thanks so much, Kathy, for having us and hope everyone stays safe uh, during this uh, inclement weather impacting many different parts of the country. Thank you, John. Really appreciate that. And thank you, Andy, for putting your contact in the chat. You all have been working extremely hard and it's valuable to us to have the fact that the Veterans Administration understands that this is a, a center mass issue for uh, our community and that you've really risen to the risen to the task with us. So we, we look forward to working with you in an ongoing way. Anyone who's on this call who isn't keyed up to them, I strongly advise you to connect to um, Andy today. Now, very delighted to welcome um, uh, from uh, Saki Vervarius, <laughs> sorry, Saki. Saki is the Director of Veterans Engagement at the White House. Really appreciate you taking time with us on this busy day to share what your words with us from the perspective of the White House. Thank you, Saki. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and I just wanna say that you know, for all the people that have already spoken and a lot of the people that are reaching out to the White House right now, um, the work that's being done out there is really inspirational. And it's, it's, been, it's been personally inspiring for me to just see how much work people are doing out there to, to try to get this right. Um, I'm here just to provide an update um, you know, a lot of the information I'm going to go over is going to be redundant, especially for some of the people who've already speaking who are already well aware of some of these things, but I think they just bear saying out loud again. Um, so having said that, just I, I will drop my, uh, my contact information so that the folks on this call can reach out to me, but I am at the Office of Public Engagement. Um, feel free to reach out to me at any time. Uh, just let, let us know how things are going out there, and um, you know what you, how you guys, how you guys are doing, and what we can do to help. So, as, as most of you know, um, yesterday General McKenzie of the U.S. Central Command announced that the last American aircraft departed Kabul is scheduled in the early morning hours of August 31 local time. Thanks to the men and women serving in uniform, we've now completed the largest airlift in U.S. history. During the past 17 days, our troops evacuated over 120,000 U.S. citizens, citizens of our allies, and our Afghan allies with unmatched courage, professionalism, and resolve. Our 20-year military presence in Afghanistan has ended. The unanimous recommendation of the Joint Chiefs and all of our commanders on the ground was to end our airlift mission as planned. Ending the military mission was the best way to protect the lives of our troops and secure the prospects of civilian departures for those who want to leave Afghanistan in the weeks and months ahead. Our ability to address certain ISIS-K threats in Afghanistan in recent days is no guarantee that future attacks can be prevented. This was an exceedingly dangerous moment and an exceedingly dangerous mission. We can mitigate risk, but we cannot eliminate it. We are here in a period of serious danger, given what we are seeing in the intelligence. The longer we remained, the risk of military conflict with Taliban forces increased. Taliban occupies Kabul. That's just the reality. We were able to coordinate with them in our evacuation, but after August 31, that coordination would likely wane, put more troops at risk, jeopardize our ability to help Americans and those who worked with us to get out. Our commitment to American citizens and those who worked with us doesn't end today. We have been very clear on that point. 
After today, we have substantial leverage to hold the Taliban to its commitments to allow safe passage for American citizens, legal permanent residents, and Afghan allies eligible to come to the United States. We will use that leverage to, mac to the maximum extent and work with international the international community to make sure the Taliban does not falter on these commitments. Secretary of State will lead the continued coordination with international partners to ensure safe passage for any Americans, Afghan partners, and foreign nationals who want to leave Afghanistan. You, the UN Security Council passed a resolution that sends a clear message of what the international community expects the Taliban to deliver on moving forward, including freedom of travel. The Secretary's work will also include ongoing diplomacy in Afghanistan and coordination with partners in the region to open the airport for departures and humanitarian assistance. President Biden is urging all Americans to join him in grateful prayer for three things. First, for our troops and diplomats who carried out a mission of mercy in Kabul and at tremendous risk, such unparalleled results and airlift that evacuated tens thousands more people than any imagined possible. Second, as you all are doing, the network of volunteers and veterans who helped identify those needing evacu evacuation, guided them to the airport and provided support along the way. And to everyone who is now and who will welcome our Afghan allies to their new homes around the world and in the United States. Uh, the president is actually delivering an address to the American people right now. I would encourage you guys, if you have time, to go back and look at it. Um, we, our office is here to take any of your concerns and, uh, and try to set up other meetings where we can engage with you all. Um, please feel free to reach out to me. And with that, I kick it back to you. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, Saki. We really appreciate your partnership. We appreciate the fact that you're willing to be with us and to share these words and these insights. And uh, it means a lot to us that we can continue to work with you into the future as we figure out how, together with our government partners, um, we can make a difference in this situation. So thank you, Saki. So um, as we are all uh, very passionately involved in helping our Afghan allies, uh, SIVs and um, uh, friends from Afghanistan. We also are caring for our own community. I think most of us on this call have uh, had deep feeling ourselves and among our constituents, our members, we've seen a lot of sadness, a lot of grief, a lot of strong feelings. Um, so we are asking some of our partners who are experts in mental health to help us address the questions of how we can serve our community of um, veterans, active duty service members, families, caregivers, survivors, wounded warriors with this time. I'm uh, delighted to welcome Caitlin Thompson, Vice President, Community Partnerships for Cohen Veteran Network and a White Oak Collaborative Steering Committee member to lead this next panel on mental health. Caitlin, how are you? I'm good, Kathy, thank you so much. Um, so it's been, you know, it's been quite a time. And for those of us who are in the mental health field, we we feel so much, uh, so much of this too. Um, and so I'm thrilled that we have an opportunity to talk with practitioners about some really, I want us to get like some really good practical, concrete guidance so that by the end of the next half hour, you'll have some ideas of really how to move forward in instead of feeling kind of that hopelessness that I think a lot of us and helplessness that a lot of us are feeling right now. So to that end, um, so that we can dive into the conversation, I'm just gonna briefly say who the panelists are and then my wonderful um, colleague, Nicole, is going to put their bios, links to their bios in the chat for you. So uh, first we have Dr. Tina Atherall, who is the CEO of PsychArmor. We have Bonnie Carroll, who's the president and founder of TAPS. Uh, Steve Schwab, who is the CEO of the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, and Stacey Vasquez, who's the Vice President of Brain and Mental Health, she needs to be my Vice President then, uh, for the Wounded Warrior Project. Um, welcome everybody. 
Um, as, as I said, we're just gonna get right into it and really get to some of the practical guidance. So Tina, I wanted to start with you. Um, what advice do you have for uh, uh, veteran service organizations, military service organizations, or any other pra uh, practitioners right now about how, what to do right now in this moment? There's so, so much opportunity. So I'll let you start. And I want the rest of the panelists to just jump in. This is a total conversation. And everybody out there, please send in um, questions or concerns or um, or any thoughts that you have. Love to hear from you. Thanks, Tina. Hi, Caitlin. Hello to all the fellow pan panelists. So great to be here again with you today. Um, you know, Caitlin, I think it just takes us a, a moment to pause and reflect also on where we've been over the last year and a half, two years. Um, I think that the one thing that I've heard resonating not only from community leaders or our organizational leaders, but also members um, that we're here to serve is that we've been preparing for a lot of this for many, many years. Um, and so to look at the, the length of work of many of the panelists that are here, um, they've been building and learning and listening. And so that is the number one thing is to have that humility to understand that we don't necessarily know what everyone is experiencing at every moment, just because yet again, it's another headline, right? And I saw that happen. Um, we saw that in our own teams. It was so important um, just as an organizational leader to once again, check in with everyone first. Um, how many of you saw the tremendous check-in support amongst our community and systems that activated. So I just wanna first take that moment to say there was some incredible work that has been done by all of you right in that moment and even before we really knew what was ahead of us. Um, but another thing just to share, and again, knowing the tremendous amount of leadership that's on this call is that we are also stronger because of our community members around us. So also making sure that those community members that are supporting our organizations feel that they are supported and understand what we are experiencing as a collective group is so important. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get further into our discussion. Great. Steve, do you have any follow-ups? What, what are you all doing at, um, at Elizabeth Dole right now to both take care of yourselves and take care of your teams, but also really taking care of the rest of your community? Caitlin, thanks. Um, I'll start with taking care of ourselves because as Tina noted, lots of us have forecasted and, and knew that this withdrawal from Afghanistan was gonna happen, but I don't think any of us were fully prepared for the full emotion um, that we're all facing now today, especially as we saw the last C-17 take off, um, marking a historic period in our nation's history. I'll tell you that that's meant for me and for my team and for all the practitioners who are with us, it's thanking our folks for the hard work that they've been doing. It's thanking leaders like all of those on this panel right now, Bonnie Carroll, who's leading and we're all following her from behind leading the, the, the um, support for all the families who've lost fallen soldiers overseas. What it means for us, Caitlin, in practical terms is putting our oxygen masks on as we're providing oxygen to other folks, right? It's finding ways to provide that oxygen and that support to our own team so that we can be strong in moving our services and supports forward. At Dole Foundation, we pivoted really, really quickly when it became obvious that this withdrawal was gonna be expedited. We've provided, and even this evening, we'll be providing more mental, acute mental and emotional health support. Bonnie will be joining our partners at Wounded Warrior Project um, for yet another community-wide moment to really process um, all of these events that are building up in each of us and creating stress and anxiety and can get in the way of our ability to support ourselves and the communities in which we support. And so my advice to our colleagues is one, step back and find ways to get away from the noise, right? That means that those of us that are working on the front lines need to take a break, take a walk, um, watch a silly movie. Last night, I listened to meditative music from like 11 to 12 a.m. The first time I put, got away from my computer and it just, it, it gave me, it gave me an outlet. Uh, before I went to sleep. It's giving your, your teammates a break. We're going to be giving some mental health days off to our folks where and when we can, based on circumstances on the ground, um, facing the families that we serve. And then it's finding 
the strength of your organizations, right? The mission, the core mission uh, that we all provide. What are the ways that we can stretch that mission right now to create impact in the communities that we focus on? Thank you, Steve. Such such great um, great examples of of things to do, especially with your team, Bonnie. I you know I'm I've been thinking so much about you, your organization, and your community. Um, and not only are you are you managing grief for loved ones who we are losing right now, but also grief of loved ones we've lost, and also just grief in general about this whole situation. Um, you know, there was a question I saw in the chat about like how do you cope? How do you help people cope with unfocused anger, which I I think might be a part of grief, but I'm hoping you can just speak to that a little bit. Absolutely, Caitlin, thank you. And Steve, thank you. You and Tina for your words, you're so right. We need to take care of ourselves during this time and everyone on this call needs to just check in with those, those around them. We are uh, on this journey together and we are in this for a very long, long haul ahead. For the families of our fallen, you know, we're there in the immediate providing safety and stabilization for those who are new on the grief journey, but for thousands of our family members, this is now a time when we've seen folks re-examining their loss and looking at it again through a new lens of the meaning of the service of their loved one and the sacrifices made. So we pivot to reflecting on the life lived. We had one of our surviving daughters who was just a child when her father died in Afghanistan. She's now a young adult. And she wrote an absolutely beautiful article for us in that first day of the deaths at the Kabul airport. And she said, you know, I reflected on the seeds of love my father sowed in his family and in Afghanistan, that he truly loved the people there. And he knew that what he was doing mattered and was important. And she said, that's what has sustained her throughout her entire life as she's grown up without him. And sharing those words, reflecting back on the life lived, not just the trauma of the moment of the manner of death and recognizing that while our community is grieving and re-grieving losses, we also have folks now who are coming together to wrap their arms around each other, to, to reach forward, to become peer mentors, to be there for others. And that's a beautiful testimony to the strength of this community, to each one of you on this call that you're leaning in, you're present this afternoon, you've dialed in, you are gaining resources, you're connecting with amazing support like Lutheran uh, Immigration and with Kobe at Red Cross and all of the just beautiful things that are happening. This is a moment in the history of the world where we are leaning in and being better for having cared about the humanity. It is heartbreaking to see those who are at risk right now. Many of us are involved in trying to get folks out who we know are just extraordinary good. And I'm reminded of that quote uh, that uh, when good men do nothing, evil triumphs. So on this call, good men and women are stepping forward to do something. We are making a difference. We are caring for each other. We are honoring those who have sacrificed, who have been wounded, those who are caring for the wounded, those who are grieving the losses. And because we are doing this, we are the better for it. And we will be there for the people of Afghanistan going forward as we are for people struggling around the world because that's what America is about. So regardless of the politics right now and what we're seeing in the chaos and, and as Steve so beautifully said, you know, just the noise that is happening, we all are rising above that to know that we have the ability to give strength and to empower those on the front lines, those on our team. So we're here together. And again, Caitlin, thank you for allowing the families of the fallen to be present in this conversation. Oh my gosh, yes, of course. And yes, thank you for what for everything that you just said and everything you do. Um, as we lean in um, to this and into each other, Stacy, can you talk a little bit about um, what WWP is doing? I know that you're newer to the organization, but you have such an incredible background too, um, as a veteran, as a, as a senior, senior leader at the VA. Um, and what are you seeing? What are you hearing? And, and how is WWP helping? Yeah, thank you for that. And thank you all for being here with us today. It's a very important discussion. Over 3.4 million men and women have served our country since 9-11 happened. 
And a lot of the images that we're seeing in the news right now um, bring up a lot of emotions for folks. And I think that all of those emotions are very normal and natural. There are well over 7,000 lives that were lost. Um, and people, I think, are reliving some of those emotions right now with some of the images. And so at Wounded Warrior Project, what we are doing is we started Operation Outreach, which is we are making calls to over 40,000 warriors that served in Afghanistan and just checking, seeing how folks are doing and listening and then connecting them with resources. Uh, and those resources could be um, from very simple things like a program where someone sits and just talks with them and listens to what they have to say. It could be um, to care that they may need in mental health care or um, resources in their communities that are closer to home to uh, have that connectedness and engage with other people that may be feeling as they're feeling. Um, and we're gonna put a link in so that you guys can get to all of those resources and has phone numbers and emails and all that kind of stuff in it. So if you know somebody who has immediate needs um, that is a great way to connect with some of these resources as well. I do, it has been really um, wonderful to see. We've been making calls to warriors to talk to them about volunteering with the American Red Cross um, and some of the efforts that Kobe was talking about earlier. And we have a number of warriors that want to volunteer to um, really focus some of their energy into something productive where they can help um, with some of these efforts. So that's been really wonderful to see how that's going, but we are definitely seeing people ha are having feelings and we want to listen and talk with folks about how they're feeling um, during this time. Thank you so much, Stacy. Um, I just wanna quickly um, take this moment to just say that Cohen Veterans Network, which is a network of now 19 mental health clinics throughout the country is also very available to military family members um, and uh, active duty service members and veterans to go in and get care. Um, beyond that, we also have a number of, we have a stress and worry course. We have things that will help to kind of, there. it isn't that everybody needs to immediately like go straight into therapy. Um, and I think that that's, that's a message. Many people certainly could use it and can use it and should reach out. Um, but across the country, we're also seeing that um, mental health services are, um, are getting scarcer. Um, at CVN, we do have a, a few clinics, uh, maybe three out of our 19, where it will take a little bit of time for you to get in to see a clinician. At other clinics, not as much, but we're working really hard to try to get more clinicians in. But what we're learning so much, which, you know, even more so now is that um, mental health clinicians are, they're getting burnout, they're getting, um, they're moving on to different, different things just to, just to get themselves uh, in better spaces. So the, the dearth of mental health providers that's available across the board is really of concern. So we really need to start supporting our mental health providers too, which I'm hoping is a lot of you on this call. And so Tina, I know that PsychArmor just started a new consultation service um, and I'm hoping that you can then now speak to that a little bit. Actually, Caitlin, could I, could, oh. before Tina chimes in, I just Please. wanna yeah. put a big exclamation point on something you just said. And I think, you know, we have the benefit of being with hundreds of colleagues across the country who were locking arms with virtually to do the important work of supporting our families now as, as our troops come home and that the road ahead is gonna be a long one. But right now, and I wanna, I wanna say this very plainly, we do have a mental health crisis in this country. We were facing one before this withdrawal um, as it relates to COVID, right? Mental health practitioners were already working 24 seven to respond to needs related to folks being in their homes and away from society. And now the families that we're serving, I can tell you from, from our standpoint, and I know from so many other organizations, our number one request is mental and emotional health care support. And so that's why many of us are, are doing these, these events that include a group therapy kind of approach. And so um, I'm gonna, you know, um, call my colleagues in White Oak to arms as it relates to a pursuit of some policy um, 
objectives around increasing resources for mental and emotional health right now. We need to be on the phone with leaders at the VA. And I know Secretary McDonough committed to this in a call that he had with VSO and MSO leaders that, that I know Bonnie was on that call and others were um, last Friday, where he said he was going to make more resources available at the VA. We need to see DOD do the same thing. We all need to be unified in calling on um, our executive branch partners and Congress to release programming and funds to provide our community the support, to provide society the support it needs right now um, to, to deal with this emergency mental and emotional health crisis. What I can also tell you, I'll, I'll conclude here is, um, I know at EDF, if you're a caregiver or you're a family member or you're a veteran and you can't get into a mental health provider, contact us. Um, we will find one for you. Um, we don't have those folks on staff. We may at some point in the future, given what we're learning, but we'll find one. Um, and uh, I know so many other organizations feel the same way, but it's really, really important for us as a leadership group at White Oak to, to pay attention um, and, and call, call for some resources right now. Definitely, Steve, thank you for saying that. And, you know, I also want to comment on what Mrs. Dunford asked in, in the chat too, is, you know, what, what should we tell people when they're told that they're going to be on a wait list? Um, so my recommendation um, beyond finding organizations like Elizabeth Dole Foundation or Wounded Warrior Project or TAPS, depending, um, is to really um, find something that is not necessarily at that moment, the mental health therapy that you may need. If you need immediate support, then everybody should be able to provide that if you're in a crisis. But if they're saying you can wait, you know, you may need to wait four weeks, five weeks, stay on the wait list. That's my first recommendation. Don't just say, okay, well, never mind, I'm not going to do this. Get on that wait list because more people are going to leave the wait list, more people are going to be hired. Um, but then there are these other, but then in the meantime, um, find other other spaces like as Shelly is saying the star providers the hidden heroes um uh, uh connections um wounded the wounded the warrior uh, wellness alliance etc there are places and i know that there are so many things to be writing down right now and we're going to get you all of those lists but um but certainly um certainly you know keep keep staying there and keep just arming yourself with all of these other incredible resources. And with that team, I do want to get to the consultation um, service because I think this is going to really help the providers who are caring for those who, who really need this help too. Yeah, thanks for that. And Steve, I think you set it up. We're, we're always talking about the macro micro approach, which is also what I love. Like when I teach students to say, you can't just teach clinical practice without understanding the policy that holds that practice in place and vice versa. We all know the wonderful um, analogy around, you know, the, the river and pulling them out at the bottom of the river or stopping what's throwing them in. So with all of that, I think, you know, those of us as leaders, we, we have great knowledge of what's happening at the community level and what's happened in our own military community that has led the stage to things like community information exchanges. So there's some great nonprofits and that you guys have already named, Unite Us, AWP, um, you know, uh, combined arms at all of these so anybody who may not be at that leadership level in their organization and they're trying to put the pieces together and you're watching the resource box right now think about utilizing so uh, technology for social good so where do you got to go that's going to help connect you to those warm handoffs so to transition over to where um uh, around uh, our community providers and the mental health health ability. So first and foremost, my nervousness coming out of a, a hard weekend a few weekends ago and leading up to that was in my role and our role here at Psych Armor that all of you participate in is all around helping educate our community on the really unique community that we re represent. And healthcare providers are one of the most unique learners in our learning ecosystem. And so healthcare provider training, just from the basis of cultural training, those of us that have been doing cultural competency. So guess what my fear was? I thought, oh my goodness, what about my young clinician that's coming out of school? And by the way, may not have been young. I wasn't young. I was like that older student, but I was a young practitioner. What if they don't understand what all this means? And by the way, 
um, Stacy was talking about this before, and, and it's true, like th there's also other areas where our healthcare or mental health teams or organizational leaders, many of you have been crushed in other areas, COVID, disaster response, uh, civil rights, social injustice, injustice response. And so my number one concern was how do we make sure that those that are serving our community are aware and feel that they're equipped to sit and listen and hold space to what's happening on the headlines. So cultural, uh, or I'm sorry, clinical consultation for all of you that understand that from a practitioner's lens, if you're an organizational leader and you have mental health teams that you are responsible for, I think we have some amazing healthcare insurers on this call that already dedicate resources to this. We started clinical consultation so that we could provide space for small groups, less than 15, just to be able to say, what are the hard conversations that you're trying to navigate right now? And how do we best support you? Because if we're driving to great outcomes on your practice, you're going to ultimately be able to affect our military affiliated community. And those are the outcomes that we're looking for. So clinical consultation, thanks, Caitlin, I think is number one. What also happens in that is we're actually really providing supportive work for those clinicians that are really tired. And oh, to Steve, to your point, I really don't mean the word clinician. Listen, I haven't practiced as a clinical social worker the majority of my career, but the strength is in that social support, psychoeducation, evidence-based, and building strong social supports. We all come together to talk about something. We have a shared experience and we learn more. So that is, I think it's the simple things, right? It's those things of just go break bread together, have somebody sitting at the table to help navigate some hard conversations. We're going to do a lot better down the road and help ourselves at the same time feel stronger in our work. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tina. And I'm just looking at this chat, just exploding with these incredible resources. Um, so proud to be a part of this community. Um, and with that, Bonnie, can you talk a little bit about some practical things that you're doing, your organization is doing um, to really, to, to just, uh, to just stay safe and stay healthy and stay, um, prepared for the, the, the next thing that's going to in, inevitably come uh, to you. Oh, Caitlin, I appreciate that. And, you know, our, we have a 24 seven helpline and we're seeing now a lot of calls coming in during the night from families who are having trouble sleeping, who really can't kind of put this all out of context to understand that they've been overloaded by the news during the day and then that noise just doesn't stop at night. So while our helpline has been going around the clock, we've been stepping up our support and self-care for those on our helpline to bring them together for end of shift, beginning of shift, just times to process what they've been hearing. We have 120 amazing staff who are primarily peer professionals, survivors themselves, who are wrapping their arms around each other to process their own grief and how they are re-examining this. Many of us in this space you know, have been caregivers, our veterans have uh, experienced loss. And uh, so for all of us, this is an opportunity to help each other to, as I said earlier, just lean in on all the supports available. This, this call this afternoon has been such a blessing. It's been this time when we can all just know that we are not alone, that we have resources and they're amazing, extraordinary resources that we can rely on and lean into. So Caitlin, it is an opportunity just to take care of each other and to recognize that this is difficult on so many levels, but uh, we are gonna be there for our community and we are gonna help folks through this because we have the tools. Absolutely, Bonnie, thank you. You know, with that, and I, Chris Johnson just wrote, you know, don't forget about the wildfire victims. Don't forget about the hurricane victims. Don't forget about the people who are struggling with COVID right now. I mean, this is, this is not, this is just such a compound, you know, one thing on top of the next, on top of the next. And so combing that out could be really hard of like, even, even for me, I'm not, I'm not a veteran. I am not a military family member, but I've been in this field, in this space for a long time. But, you know, I wonder like kind of some recommendations or, or I guess my thing is like, is it, is it important to comb out which feeling is coming from where, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm just asking, like, I don't know if that's the importance or is it just kind of the overall what's Kayla, I just, yeah, yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned that, that there are so many 
losses. And that's what's beautiful about our military community. We honor the life and the service. Yeah. And it isn't about the moment or the manner of death or the, the type of crisis. We recognize that when our folks are struggling, we're going to be there for them. Yeah. So, it, you know, I, I love that about the Department of Veterans Affairs. It is the same headstone for our fallen. It is the same American flag. And we honor those. There was an Air Force captain who tragically died in a motorcycle accident. And he's not in the headlines, but his family is nonetheless grieving his loss. And that's a tremendous loss to the Air Force community. So we wrap our arms around all those who have served this country and we are there for them and there for each other. Thank you. Yeah. Stacy, can you speak a little bit more to maybe some some practical things that Wounded Warrior Project? I just am always wanting the practical because I think we know a lot about what the problems are, but we want to get some take home lessons for people to, to, to take with them. Um, you know, I I. I I, I always feel a little uncomfortable calling you out, but you're, you're this extraordinary veteran. You've been, you've served, you've, um, you've come back, you were, uh, you know, in the leadership at VA. What are you hearing from your friends who you may serve, have served with? What are you hearing from in your communities beyond the, the VSO, MSO community that we should be more knowledge about, more knowledgeable about? What are we missing? I think the peer-to-peer -peer listening has been really important for us. While there may not be enough mental health providers, I do think we all have the ability to be a good peer and listen to one another. And for me, I, I try to take one thing at a time um, because that's pretty much what I can process in the grieving process for me. And um, through and through COVID in the hospital, that's what I did. I took one each episode as it happened one at a time. And so that was really important. And I think that's the premise of some of the programs that we all have developed out there is that there's peer to peer discussions that can happen. There are just places where we can listen to what's going on. And it doesn't have to, um, it doesn't always have to lead to a mental health provider for that to happen. So I think that's really important. And I can't overemphasize how important some of these activities are in the small groups where maybe there's something like soldier ride that people are going on uh, and they're going to ride a bike together and they'll end up talking while they're on that ride together. So those things cannot be underestimated. That wellness that comes with it and getting outside and maybe you connect um, in a different way for me, I walked to the Lincoln the other night and I watched the sunset go over Arlington from the backside. And that's part of my process uh, for where I'm at right now. So I think there's things we can all do and give each other ideas of ways that we can take care of ourselves. And being a good listener, I probably get more from listening to people than they get. That's so powerful. And I'm, I got chills when you said you, uh, your, when you walk to the Lincoln Memorial, like, yeah, that's exactly the type of, of feeding, nurturing of yourself that, that you need. And I want to challenge everyone on the call to think about what is your equivalent of go walking to the Lincoln Memorial in sunset? Like, what is something that comes to mind for you? And go do it, like, at least in the next day, <laughs> if it's as long as it's practical. Um, I, I'm noticing, so we have what, five, six minutes left. So um, I wanna give an opportunity to not ask any questions and just to let you each say something that you, your interest, you wanna make sure this audience can hear. Um, so uh, Steve, let's start with you. Sure. Um, well, you know, we're an organization that focuses um, on the millions of military and veteran caregivers. Um, and you know, Bonnie, we've talked a lot about the incredible work that you're doing to support families of the fallen. And we also know that there are many new families that we're welcoming into the caregiving community as a result of the sad events that happened in Afghanistan last week. We'll be at Walter Reed this week, seeing, seeing many of those folks and making sure they know what's available to them by way of support in the caregiving community. And that prompts me to say to the rest of our friends on the call today that um, bear in mind that um, you know, many folks have said that the road ahead is gonna be a long one. Um, and uh, that's certainly true of family members, caregivers, children inside military families whose lives have been impacted 
due to deployments, but also because mom and dad comes home and has mental and emotional wounds that may be hard for that child to deal with. All of that means that we need to wrap our arms around these families in bigger ways than we even have been, finding ways to communicate and over communicate with these families because we know that there's still a stigma out there to asking for help. I've been really pleased to see the numbers of families who are raising their hands and that's prompted us at Dole Foundation to be more proactive in encouraging other families in our community to do the same. Um, and one of the best ways you can do that is to have folks who represent your community speak to your community directly. So for us, that's putting caregivers out to talk to other caregivers and telling them in very transparent terms that I'm having a hard time. And if you are, raise your hand and ask for support. Um, putting veterans out there, telling veterans that they need to raise their hands and ask for support when they need it is important. We're gonna do the same later this year for children um, who can speak to other children and tell them that if they need a safe space or someone to talk to, that there's someone available to them. So I think, you know, I'll close by just saying, let's stick together on this long road ahead. I think forums like this are gonna be really important. Coalitions like White Oak are super important. And it's just a joy and an honor to be with you all um, today. Thank you, Steve. Bonnie, I also just want to um, acknowledge your extraordinary service um, in the military and your uh, being a veteran. Thank you. Um, and I'm wondering if, you know, for for other others who may not be post 9-11 veterans necessarily, um, if you can within your, I mean, and, and I want you to say what you want to say too, but if you can also just speak to things that you might be hearing with some of your friends who may be a little bit older who um, have who haven't experienced this crisis necessarily, but um, how we can support them as well. Oh, well, thank you, Caitlin. And, and again, please, TAPS.org, our 24-7 helpline is available to all of you. Uh, grief related to a loss, but grief related to this situation in general. Please reach out. We have wonderful resources and, and we collaborate with so many of you. Many of you have participated in the TAPS Institute for Hope and Healing webinars that are going on constantly. So lots of additional resources that are available. Caitlin, thank you so much uh, for mentioning my service. I got to spend uh, a year in Iraq uh, as a Department of the Army civilian and then have been to Afghanistan many, many times working with our programs there and have come to know the people and have built bridges between our surviving families of America and the surviving families of the Afghan army. You know, we grieve together as a community. It is. You know, grief is about love and we grieve because we have a broken heart and we can come together in that that common bond so thank you for the opportunity to be part of this community it's been an extraordinary opportunity just pause and take care of each other so thank you for that beautiful thank you bonnie stacy last last words last uh, thoughts I think that um, Bonnie said something that really resonated with me and what we're feeling right now actually makes us human beings. And I think acknowledging that and walking through it together is really, um, it's something that is very necessary right now. And as we approach um, closer to 9-11 in the 20th anniversary, I think it's gonna be especially important that um, all of the different practitioners and providers and groups that are going to be providing services um, re-energize because that's an important time uh, for all of our warriors and all the families that have lost loved ones and a lot of remembering and especially with our law enforcement also that endured losses in first responders. So I think this is we're going to head into that we got to re-gear ourselves and get ready for the next round. Wow, you're absolutely right, Stacy. And yeah, that's such important important advice and um, and something to remember. Tina, I'm going to let you have the last word. Yeah, I'll try to so make it quick. It up. Yeah, Stacy, Stacy nailed it. Stacy, I love working with you, man. Like we're like I'm sitting there going, gosh, she just went right where I was going to go on that one. Um, so extending from that is that also allowing us the permission if we need to shut off. It doesn't mean that we're you know. We're, we're not holding space for our friends or our community or whatnot. And so I've heard a lot of, of individuals say, 
I don't feel right at finding joy in this. Many of us have had some milestones in sending our kids off to school or, you know, really great family events. So one of the things that we found last week when we released 15 things military and veteran kids want you to know was actually a camp corral initiative with DAV and they work a lot with children of fallen and wounded is that people in the chat were saying that they just wanted to be able to be present for their children and they didn't know how to do that and make it okay. And that what we remind everyone is that our children are listening. They are the voices sitting at the table, they're hearing us. So if you can't do it for yourself, turn the TV off, shut out the noise and really be present for your children because they're the ones who are gonna amplify how we're all gonna be on the other side of all of this, right? Like. Remember that song, the children of the future, I like want to like cue up the tune, but it is really, really super. So it's okay. Turn the, t turn it off, enjoy your families. Um, and, and to your point, we've got to go back to the anniversaries of some really powerful things in the coming weeks. And we have to be ready for that. Absolutely. Well, thank you all. This was wonderful. Kathy, back to you. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Steve, Stacy, Tina, Bonnie, really fantastic panel. Um, uh, so I, I will, it's time now for us to wrap up. Here is my commitment to all of you here. We were, are going to compile a list of resources. Two things. First, the resources that can be searchable relative to the work that needs to be done for Afghan allies and on mental health, um, and to the extent that we have information about helping getting more um, Afghanis uh, assisted who still need to leave that area. We'll, we'll put those together. So we're gonna ask you both uh, and, and an after action email for those resources that we can compile. We'll also do a separate list of the organizations on this call who wish to share what they are doing um, in response to this Afghan crisis, whether it's to do with um, resettlement support or with mental health assistance or with um, assistance for those Afghan allies and um, individuals who are still overseas. Um, you do not have to be a member of the White Oak Collaborative to be listed on that form. It will be on the White Oak um, website, and we'll pa pass a link to that, but we will collect that information so we can create the transparency and continue to share. Um, Blue Star Families will continue to work with the White Oak Collaborative to bring more information and panels like this to you. Also, through our chapters, we'll be providing volunteer opportunities for our military-connected community, military families, and veteran families, as well as our civilian neighbors to support. We know many of you will be doing that as well. Um, my heart is full in sharing this work with all of you. Uh, the fight has had challenges, and there has certainly been heartbreak, but there is so much for us to be proud of for the work that all of us, whether we were military serving families or those who are supporting them during this 20 year fight. There's much for us to be proud of in the work that we have ahead of us. Thank you for joining with us. Thank you for being such excellent partners. And I look forward to being with you all soon. Thank you.